As I mentioned earlier in the service, 2022 has been a year of change, hasn't it? It's been a year that people haven't quite got what they wanted in their New Year promises. They thought perhaps economically we would recover, but as we know, interest rates on houses have gone up and people are suffering despite having so-called full employment. The wages are low compared to the cost of living. People's lives have changed. Their efforts, their character or good character has disappeared. They are now willing to take what they want, not care about others, get into lifestyles which are unbecoming and just not care anymore. They leave their jobs at the drop of a hat. They try something new, a new lifestyle, and yet they have no focus. Even those in the church have dropped out. A worldwide survey said that one third of the people attending church dropped out. Only a third kept going regularly and the other third irregularly. We have lots to look forward to this year because we have fixed our eyes on Jesus, the finisher and author of our faith. And if we keep on doing that, we have a very positive year. We may see governments change and society generally attack Christians for their faith. We've already seen that in 2022. People praying on the street being arrested. People being harassed for their faith. We've also seen education drop out of the window. Some schools in New Zealand report a 50% truancy. And yet, anecdotally, and in the school that I help at, we have near full attendance because they are faith-based schools. They are teaching more than just the general things of mankind. They are teaching hope and faith. Over these two weeks, we're finishing off our studies in the book of Joshua. And we've nearly come to the end at Joshua 23. So today we're going to Joshua 23. And it's on page 174 in the Pew Bibles. You know, Joshua, he calls a national assembly of the leaders to deliver what you might call his last will and testament. And it tells us about the things that are weighing most on his mind and on his heart for the people of God as he considers the end of his long life of earthly service. As we read it through, we will be reminded of Paul's word to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. At the end of his own long ministry, he said, The time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Really positive words. He knows that the Lord will award him a reward. But not just to him, but to all who are long for his appearing. All those who are faithful to the end. Not only is Paul saying, I'm finishing my race, he is calling them to finish theirs, that along with him, they may receive their reward. And in many ways, we're going to see that's exactly what Joshua is saying to the people here in chapter 23. This is his final call to the people of God to, that are entrusted in his care. And he says to them, in effect, as I now consider crossing the finish line and finishing my own race, let me strongly encourage you now to do the same. Finish the race. We're going to look at four points as we look at the teaching from this chapter 23. First of all, there is an example to follow. Look for the way that Joshua himself embodies the very perseverance and godliness to which he calls his people. 
Secondly, in verses 1 to 5, there's an encouragement to embrace. Joshua does not rush directly to challenge and obligation. He starts by reminding them of God's free grace and goodness towards them. And then third, in verses 6 to 11, there's an exhortation to obey. There's a call here to persevere and continue on the path of holiness and devotion to the Lord. He has redeemed us. And finally, in verses 12 to 16, there is an end to avoid. There's a call here to perseverance and continuing in the path of holiness. But when we get to this part, this end to avoid, part of the faithful biblical exhortation is necessarily negative. Not just positive encouragement, but a warning. What will happen if you turn your back to the Lord and instead, instead follow idols and the contrary to his commandments? And so there's judgment for backsliding and disobedience, and we must learn to face the warning given to us. So let's read together Joshua chapter 23 on page 174. And after a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them. Joshua, by then, old and well advanced in years, summoned all Israel, the elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember now, I have allotted as an inheritance to, for your tribes, all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered, between the Jordan and the Great Sea in the West. The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push, push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land, as the Lord your God promised you. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the Lord Moses, without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain amongst you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. And so be very careful. To love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of those nations that remain amongst you, and you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become your snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Now I am about to go the way of all the earth, and you know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God has given you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as every good promise of the Lord your God has come true, so the Lord will bring on you all the evil he has threatened until he has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Recently, there was a study done by scholars examining 16 U.S. foreign wars that involved a regime to change and nation building after the initial success of their invading military. In all but four of them, including the First and Second World War, while the force of American military power ensured initial victory, the establishment of viable long-term democratic governments had proven elusive. Think about Iraq or Afghanistan as recent examples of states that were successfully defeated and battled by the US. Their governments were toppled, but they are not very different today in their willingness to accept the American democracy 
than they were before the invasion. And it proved that winning a war is one thing, but building a nation is another thing entirely. Conquering the land is one thing, but establishing new ways of life for the people on that land is entirely another thing. Now think for a moment about the situation facing Israel as Joshua addresses them here in chapter 23. They've conquered Canaan, the land's been divided between the tribes for an inheritance, and the issue now is building the sustainable life according to God's plan and the land that he has given to them. In verse 1, it tells us a long time has gone since the land was initially taken over. And some commentators suggest that there's as many as 25 years that has passed since the events that are recorded in the earlier chapters, chapters 13 to 21. And Joshua is now an old man, and he is determined to do whatever he can to ensure that Israel learns to build a life in the land that they've been given. So today we're going to look at these examples, these four examples. And the first one is an example to follow. Before we look at his address to the leaders, we need to pause and consider the first place, uh, this example. There is an example here to follow. Notice the first one, the circumstances. We've already begun to sketch them out a little. And it says, after a long time has passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all the enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, the leaders, etc. And it's a great summary of how well life has been going since the land was taken up and divided amongst each of the tribes. And it almost reads like it should finish off at this point. You know, we have that final little verse, and then Joshua retired to a sleepy little village in Galilee where he lives today with his pet sheep. And he lives happily ever after. You know, things are going great. Joshua has led them through battles and disputes and successes and setbacks. He has governed the people well, and through him the Lord's poured out on them all the blessings that he had promised to give them. So surely if ever there was a man that could say to himself, you know what, I've done my part. It's now time for me to retire. The young ones need to take over. I can finally retire from the service of the Lord. If ever there was a man, it surely was Joshua. The thought, however, does not cross his mind. Even in his old age, even here in chapter 23, as chapter four, uh, 24 tells us that he finally died when he was 110. So we are talking old age. If you're a generation older than me, well, don't be offended. You're not as old as Joshua. And here he is, and he's still burdened with the welfare of the people. He knows he doesn't have long left to go. And verse tell, uh, 2 tells us, I am old and well advanced in years. And verse 14, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. My time's almost up, he's saying. I fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've won the prize. But before I go, I want to make sure that you hear me press on towards the godliness that's been put ahead of me. He wants to squeeze whatever usefulness that he has in his body, the time allotted to him on this earth for God's service. And so he summons Israel to continue faithfulness. But do you see here, as he summons them, he issues the call for them to persevere. He is himself in a vivid example of that very same perseverance. Let me apply this in two ways before we move on. First of all, and most obvious, there is a word here, surely, for our senior people. Let the example of Joshua remind you, as it was meant to remind Israel, that there's no quitting in the service of God. No retirement from his service. Certainly, circumstances change, the energy levels, the mobility may require a change of pace, even of role. But while you draw breath, the Lord has a work for you to do. And so you're called to be Joshua Lowe. Take stock of your remaining days 
and to seek the Lord on how you might squeeze from them every last ounce of usefulness that you have before the Lord. We need to pray Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And so maybe in your senior years, you need to step back from the preoccupation of the small stuff and those details and turn your attention to how best encourage the younger generation who are coming up before, behind you, how you can encourage them and be an example of your godliness, of character, and your conviction that you have before the Lord. And they will need that same conviction as they face the challenges that lie ahead of them. How can you set them up to be of the best service for the Lord well in their generation? That no doubt someone did the same for you when you were young. The second application I want to make from Joshua's example is that we should be reminded that Joshua himself is a picture of Jesus. He points to Jesus Christ. And if Israel was meant to imitate Joshua as they make Canaan their home, Aren't we to fix our eyes on the greater one than Joshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Jesus himself said we should be doing that during his own farewell speech to the disciples in the upper room. In John 15, verse 10, we read, If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. He is the example we are to follow. He is the model of obedience. We are to keep his commandments just as he kept his father's commandments to abide in his love. And so do not ask, what would Jesus do? As if it was just a matter of mere guesswork. Ask, what did he do? As it's revealed to us in his word. What did he say? How did he respond? How did he defeat people? There is an example here to follow. The second point we have today is an encouragement to embrace. Look at the first five verses. There are three aspects of encouragement that Joshua offers that we need in our own devotion to the Lord. Number one is that Joshua points to the grace of God. And then secondly, the character of God. And third, the promise of God. The first aspect is the grace of God. Look at verse 1. The Lord has given Israel rest from all the enemies around them. And Joshua breaks that up in verse 3 when he says, You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. In fact, so effective has been the Lord's gracious intervention on their behalf Verse 4 tells us that Joshua had already been able to divvy up all the land. God's grace, in other words, is not abstract or vague, but it has real practical value. Often we think of grace as abstract spiritual words, not practical expression. That's not what grace is. Their experience of grace was concrete and substantial, even tactile, solid. The country itself, the very dirt and the stones of Canaan were all grace to them. They planted their crops in the soil of grace. They raised their children in the cities of grace. And they went to work in a land of free grace. So grace is not vague and abstract, but it's concrete and shapes life. But they're still facing enormous ongoing challenges, having settled in the land. There are still pockets of the Canaanites there resisting. The nations around them, as subsequent history shows us, will flex their muscle and try to expand their territory and empires. And they will threaten Israel's existence. And all the time, there's this constant pressure and threat from being enticed to paganism, to idolatry, to false gods of worship. And Joshua is naturally concerned with the burden. How shall they press on and stay faithful while surrounded by all these dangers? And so his answer is that they must call to mind what the scene of the free grace of God that he's lavished on them so far. 
And if you're going to press on in the future, my brothers and sisters, you must start by taking a regular stock take of the grace of God towards you in the past. You have seen, Joshua says to them, all that the Lord has done. And so we have to remember the grace that God's shown us. We're not to lose sight of it, for it will strengthen our faith for the challenges that will come. The second aspect we have is the character of God. The second part of this encouragement, not just the grace of God, but the character of God. And he is, Joshua says, the Lord your God has fought for you. You see that phrase? It was the phrase that Moses, Moses used uh, during the Exodus from Egypt when he was calming those terrified Israelites. In Exodus 14, when the uh, armies of Pharaoh were racing towards them and they were trapped with their backs to the Red Sea. There was nowhere to go, and Moses answered those people, Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, well, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And of course, we know what happened next. The Israelites crossed over on dry land, and then the Egyptian army were drowned under that judgment of God. And that phrase appears again in Deuteronomy chapter 1, where Moses reminds the people of Israel of the day that they finally made it through the wilderness to the borders of Canaan. And yet they refused to enter the land because they had heard reports of giants in the land. And so Moses said to them, the Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as the father carries the son all the way you went until you reached this place. And on this occasion, however, the people were taken over by their fears more than they were by the promise of God. And they turned their back and they refused to enter the land. In fact, a whole generation perished in the wilderness. And now there's the same phrase over again. First of all, it's used in re uh, retrospect. God did fight for you, just as he said he would. You remember? And then you look down at Joshua 23, verse 10. The phrase is used the second time. This time in the present tense. Not only has God fought for you, he fights for you still. And so what's the message? He fights for you, and he never stops fighting for you. Again and again, past, present, and future, God will fight for you. He's active. He's working, fighting on your behalf, your shield, and your defender. The third aspect we have today under the encouragement to embrace, we have the promise of God. He says, remember what God has said. Look down at verse 5. The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He'll push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. In texts like Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy 7, God had promised them that they would conquer the land, and yet he would not remove all the Canaanites all in one go. But instead, the Israelites would grow as a nation to populate the land, and then gradually over time, God would drive out the Canaanites. And here is Joshua reminding them of that promise. It's a promise that God had shown he is faithful to keep so far, and now he calls them again to believe it. How can you fight off the attacks of discouragement and unbelief that will come in your Christian world? Well, not by screwing yourself up, by telling yourself to do better and try harder. You need to learn to walk in the plain logic of faith. First, look back and trace the ways that the Lord has shown himself to be gracious to you again and again. Starting, of course, with the gospel of his son, giving Jesus to be your redeemer, raising him from the dead, and making him, making, sorry, you, his beloved child. And then study God's word and trace the character of God, and he never deserts his children, never ceases to fight for them. You'll see that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will be your shield and your defender. And so he doesn't leave us guessing about his plans for us, does he? We have more than guesswork to guide us when we come to his purpose for us. 
For he has promised, he has mapped out the path of glory for each of us, and he will himself carry us along that road until we reach the destination. For the anchor of our faith in challenging days cannot be, how much fuel do I have left in my tank? The anchor of our faith must be, as in Joshua 23, verse 5, the Lord your God has promised. And so we're to hang all our hope on the promises of God. He who has promised is faithful, and he will surely do. The third point we have today is an exhortation to obey. In verse 6 to 11, the main point in verse 7, Joshua is concerned that they do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. Do not serve them nor bow down before them. We are to hold fast to the Lord our God as we have up till now. And then verse 12, He's a bit more explicit. He warns us, but if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, if you intermarry with them and associate with them, you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Joshua says, uh, and he's anxious that they avoid into marriage with the people outside of Israel. And this is because he knows as soon as they get married, they'll be involved with their gods and idols. Nowhere in the Bible does it forbid us to marry people from different ethnic groups. That's not the issue. The only thing stopping a man and a woman being joined together in lifelong marriage is religious and theological. It's not racial or ethnic based. God knows all too well how hard it is for one partner in a marriage to stay faithful to the Lord when the other partner is opposed to him and worships and serves other idols instead of worshipping the living God. In 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteous and wickedness have in common? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And we know that it, it's worse as we go into, into that marriage that we do get drifting away and we get compromised. And the Lord has told us to stay away from it, not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. The last point we have at the end is an end to avoid. In verses 12 to 16, you notice the consequences of turning away from the Lord to idolatry. Three times over in verse 13 and 14 and 16. He tells them if they turn from him to idols, they will perish from the good land. God says that there's no casual relationship with the Lord possible if you mix it up with the opposition. He wants you to be all in and he wants no rival. Let's not for a moment imagine, well, that's Old Testament stuff. We live in the New Covenant. That was then, this is now. Let re re me remind you of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember them? That was in Acts 5. They were lying to the Holy Spirit, and then they were dead under the judgment of God. Also in 1 Corinthians 11, 31. Some of you are weak and ill, and some of you have died because of the way you've been abusing the Lord's Supper. God is deadly serious about his covenant with us. And the question Joshua is posing is, are we serious about our covenant with him? Joshua 23 is the Old Testament equivalent of Hebrews 10 verse 26 onwards. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? 
For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so don't say, that was then and this is now. This is now. Hebrews 10.31, that's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so our God will not tolerate a rival for your affections. What should I do if I've begun to slip back? The idols have begun to capture my heart. You must realize that your only hope to escape the wrath of God is repentance and forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's never too late to repent of him. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for your mercy, acknowledging the many ways in which the idols of this world have stolen our hearts' affections. Forgive us, restore us, and bring us to repentance, whether for the very first time or renewed repentance to turn away from sin and ourselves. Not to more religion and more doing good works for ourselves as a cover-up, but to one, to the one who said, it is done and finished to the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone secures our pardon. And so we look to him now, praying in his name, the name of Jesus Christ, to be washed, cleansed, and restored. Amen.